Let's get started now. Okay, so, okay, I guess you can hear me. Um, all right, so I'll show you some um, results. And this, what I'll talk about is uh, AMFM mode. And this is not only my work, but many people are uh, working together to get to where we uh, are at now. And we have, um, yeah, I'm gonna basically focus on the method and show you some results afterward. So, um, oops, you're missing some of the side of my slide. Um, so basically, you can still get an idea of what I'm trying to show you here, even though you're missing some of the <laughs> side of the slide. On the top side, you see um, a range of uh, moduli that you can have, uh, the materials that are interesting. And on the left side here, what you're seeing is the time spent depending on the technique you can use. So at Asylum Research, we are um, really focusing on the fact that there is no one technique that can measure every material. So we um, we have several techniques, and we call this our Nanomic Pro uh, Toolkit. That's you have the uh, toolkit here on the side. And from the top, you have AMFM technique, which you can see spans quite a large range. There is force modulation and CRFM, which is contact resonance, which um, they have a little bit less of a range of moduli that can cover. There is fast force mapping force curves and nano indentation. As you can see from top to bottom, uh, the lower you are on this slide here, uh, the slower it will, you will actually obtain an image of 256 pixel by 256 pixel. So if you look from the bottom, this would probably take uh, maybe even a day. And you can take uh, you know 10 to 20 seconds to get an AMFM image if you're imaging really fast. Let's see how much you can see. Okay. Well, maybe we'll, we'll be able to go without seeing the edge of the slide. All right, so first of all, uh, why are, are we interested in AMFM? Is because it's a tapping mode technique. And tapping mode, from what you heard before, is a technique that it has many advantages. And one of them is that it's really fast. It's gentle, it's low noise. So you can get images as the one uh, you've seen this morning of uh, calcite and defect, atomic defects on the calcite where, while imaging. However, there are some limitations in terms of nanomechanical uh, properties is that you don't have a lot of observables. We have the amplitude that we're using to acquire the um, topography and we have the phase signal which we can use to um, get a ratio of um, dissipative and conservative force interaction, tip sample interactions, but it's not more than that you can get from tapping mode imaging. So once again, the reason for it is that you're using a single AFM, a single mode of the cantilever. So we, what we observe here on the left is A for amplitude and phase, and from there, the material properties are always there. However, they're uh, grouped together. So we're seeing the um, elastic and loss modulus and the indentation, they're all there, but they're grouped together. And there's no way for us to distinguish between them. So that's one limitation of single mode AFM imaging. However, if we have one, more than one mode, besides having much more complicated experiment, we get double the observable. So we have the amplitude one and phase one from the first mode and A2 and phase two from the second mode. Very simplified, if we just uh, use some models, we can um, calculate out the indentation that, and then we have access to the, um, the properties of the material, which are elastic, and uh, we can go ahead and try to figure out the lost modul uh, modulus of the sample. So again, single versus uh, bimodal is that we have double the observables. Okay, well, let me just show you both of them together so you can actually see what you're missing on this side. On the left side of the slide, you see the cantilever on top that is excited with a, with a wave. It actually um, goes and interacts with the sample and we have another, um, collection of the signal and then now we see how the signal changed. From there on we can uh, get the amplitude and the phase that I mentioned in the previous slide and we get the topography and the loss tangent of that sample. Now if we have, um, actually over here, if we 
if you look here, you have the first signal is sent to the can liver, and then we need to add another signal. This is the second mode. So what we're doing is that we're keeping this one very small compared to the to the initial amplitude, just to make sure that they don't um, overlap each other. It, it just becomes a small wiggle on top of the first signal. So we sum the two signals together. It is sent to the cantilever. The cantilever interacts with the sample. There is some um, change of the signal. And then from there on, we um, extract the information. So again, we have whatever we had when we did single mode uh, imaging. And then from the second resonance, we can look at the shift in frequency. Uh, and then we can calculate out some mechanical properties. What you're seeing here um, is that I have uh, something different than you. what you're used to seeing. Normally, you would see a piezo stack on top of your chip onto which the cantilever is attached. What I'm showing you here is a laser. And this is because um, I'm, most of the experiments that are shown here were acquired using photothermal excitation which uh, we call blue drive because it's the blue laser that we're using. So I'm going to just take a minute here to explain a little bit what it's all about. So instead of having um, a piezo stack on the chip, what we do is we um, have a blue laser going onto the, oh, I'm sorry, I have to look here. So we have blue laser, laser that is focused at the base of the cantilever. And this is uh, what's exciting in cantilever to vibrate. We still have the uh, red laser as, uh, as you're used to seeing for detection. So basically, a little dim, but you can see this is the cantilever, the detection laser, and then the blue laser at the base. What's happening is that we, as we modulate this um, blue laser, the cantilever starts to flanking. And this is how we can do our measurement. So. Um, the way it works are, is through the bimetallic effect. So if um, the lever is coated with gold, we have different, um, different materials. And then while it's heated, we can see um, oscillation. The reason we like using a photothermal excitation is that it's more stable. And um, this is important for quantitative uh, results. Additionally, you can. Um, move to uh, liquid imaging. And there, if you ever did any liquid imaging with AFM, you, see, you know that it's possible. But there's, uh, there's some difficulties with the forest of peaks, which are just uh, many, sig many um, signals coming from the whole system being excited and liquid. So what I'm showing you here on the right side is um, their actual measurement. So it's a a tune of the first mode and a second mode of a cantilever, and they, whoops, the the tunes look very clean. So, okay, before I start this short movie, what you see here in blue is a tune that was acquired on the same cantilever. However, and what you see in blue is the cantilever is being excited with the blue laser, and in red is the what you collect as information of that same cantilever, the whole chip is excited by piezo stack. So in liquid, what happens is you collect all the vibration of the whole chip, whereas if you have just the cantilever excited, you just look at what the cantilever is doing. So what's important to notice is that during, as time is passing, the blue tune still looks the same, whereas the and red, you see that peak is moving around. Because everything is changing, the liquid is moving around. So this is very important. You can still easily do an experiment with this peak, for example, the red peak here. However, if you do it over time, this peak, as you've seen in the little uh, movie here, the peak will move around. And then you're, you're not following uh, the same frequency anymore. So this is a, a big advantage of doing um, using photothermal excitation in liquid experiments. All right, so I'll jump into the results section. I'll show you some um, results that we, we got in the last months. Um, we, I'll show you some um, proof that we think that our measurements are quantitative. We, have, we did some experiments to show that um, the settings don't change the modulus, which is <laughs> what you're expecting. Um, there's a wide range of moduli that can be, uh, can be probed. And we have um, 
high spatial resolution as well as some experiments in liquid. So first, this is a polymer, uh, multi-layer polymer film. So, so you can think of it as just a piece of packaging that you use your, your regular plastic film you put on your, um, you know, you use in the kitchen. So what you see is an optical image over there. So what I knew about this, about this film is that, I, well, I knew the, the size of, um, sorry, the thickness of each polymer film, and I knew what the components were. I just didn't know what was the order. So what we did is we, um, um, we did some AFM imaging on it, and you can see that we were able to see uh, different contrast on, the, on each polymer, and we were able to ID all of them. What's interesting to notice is that loss tangent, which was uh, something you could um, easily get just from you know, single mode, regular typing mode imaging, shows you the difference between um, the polymer that's in the middle and but you don't see really the difference between the two polymers that are on each side. And even though the image is a little bit dark, you can see that the, the polymers are different. So the way we um, went or, um, and analyzed this is that we first took a reference sample of a polystyrene tin film. We imaged it and then went ahead and imaged this sample and we were able to separate all of the um, image, all of the components of this film, and we're able to get some uh, relative moduli out of this, which is very interesting because it's even though it's a range, it's a range that's pretty small, and it's not necessarily easy to differentiate between these polymers. In this image, what I wanted um, to show you is that we. Uh, I showed you first the polymers, but here we're looking at a sample that is much stiffer. It's a um, silicon wafer which was covered um, pattern with titanium stripes. So you can see the stripes are going diagonally. So the color that you're seeing is actually me varying the amplitude set point. So I'm changing the set point during the image. And as you see in phase, you also see these um, horizontal stripes, which is just me changing the the imaging settings, but if you go ahead and calculate the modulus, you can clearly see that the modulus is not changing during the time, during the time of experiment, and you see that in orange you have a silicon, and in blue are the titanium stripes on the sample. And if you do a histogram on the, on the bottom there, you can see that we are able to differentiate between the two materials very, very well. Um, so there's a wide of moduli that can be probed. So we're, we're not limited only to um, you know, very soft or very stiff materials. I'm showing you here on the left is a polystyrene polycaprolactone tin film. So in, in yellow is the polystyrene matrix and then you have the polycaprolactone inclusions and then some more polystyrene in the middle. So you can see that besides having two polymers together, you, you see a lot of small features, and um, do, during the whole experiment, you can also see the modulus of the sample, which is uh, interesting. In the middle, there is a tin lead sample, and what I'm um, showing you here is actually the topography. So the topography doesn't look that interesting. And uh, what we noticed is when we did the actual uh, analysis, when we looked at the modulus, we saw these domains. So um, I don't know exactly uh, which one, uh, I mean, I don't know exactly what's going on in the sample. It's really just solder that I um, squeezed under between two uh, mica sheets to, to have it flat. And uh, we're able to see uh, probably the tin ridge and lead ridge domains in this sample. And again, the um, titanium silicon sam sample that I showed you in the previous slide. So I just want to uh, stress that this is all of these samples can be imaged with the same type of cantilever, even though the, um, the samples are very different stiffnesses. Um, what we really uh, were interested in as well is uh, the high spatial resolution that we can obtain with uh, AMFM imaging. So what I'm showing you here is a polypropylene sample. It's a syndiotactic polypropylene, so uh, um, it's not very regular. 
what what you see in on the right side of the slide is the topography image. It's about yeah, it's a one micron scan. You see all these crystallites kind of uh, disordered. I had no control on how they uh, how they um, arrange on the surface. This is spin coated film, so they kind of arrange as they want to during uh, the evaporation of the solvent. On the sorry, on the left side here is um, just a graphic of uh, an old paper where people were interested in what's actually going on when, when polypropylene arranges in, in the crystalline domains. And there are some values that are associated with what should be the spacing between the samples. So what we did is we tried to zoom in. The previous image was one micron. This is about 55 nanometer uh, scan. And in topography, we don't see much. We know that there are some of the crystallites. Um, what you start seeing when you look at the frequency is um, you can see much clear, more clearly on the right side all these little um, um, spots which are actually the probably the, the polymers that are um, arranged in a, some, some kind of regular pattern. We looked at the spacing and the spacing uh, between these are uh, correlating with the, what we saw in literature. So this is actually really interesting because this is done in air. So you don't need much preparation. You take your spin-coated film. It's done with a regular uh, AFM tip, so nothing special. You basically put your sample in the system and start imaging and go just zoom in until you, you see the features. So since we got these nice images, we said, OK, well, um, polypropylene is interesting, but it's not so interesting to to uh, people who actually study polymers. So we try to look at, uh, oops, sorry, I should say polyethylene. Polyethylene is a uh, um, much smaller polymer. And what we learned is that it arranges in these uh, really regular crystalline um, regions when you shear it. So basically, you put some polyethylene onto the surface, and you shear it. And then the, this is how you form these uh, regular uh, crystallite areas. So on the right side here you have the topography. Again, this is pretty zoomed out, around a half a micron image. And when you start zooming in, this is 80 nanometers. Again, topography doesn't show uh, much. You know that there is uh, some high areas and low areas. But it's when you start looking at the frequency that you can see very regular arrangement of the of the polymer change, chains. And once again, the numbers that are quoted, uh, quoted um, that are <laughs> reported in literature are between 0.7 and 0.9 nanometers. And this is uh, about the spacing that we're seeing. So we're actually very excited about the fact that we can go ahead and image these um, polymers without any special prep. What we're uh, currently looking at is, um, if you look, this is the area which is the crystalline part, which the polymers are really nicely aligned. But what you're seeing here um, is actually the amorphous part of the, of the polymer chain. So it's coming out of this crystalline uh, structure and going and, and kind of being amorphous be before it goes to another, um, another crystalline area. So this is, this is actually something that is of interest of people who do research on these um, polymers. Um, OK, this, is, this would really, uh, you would see nice, more, more dramatic if there was a little bit more contrast. But this is uh, an image obtained in liquid, and it's DNA. It's done in um, AMFM mode. And again, you can, um, a little bit more contrast. You can see in frequency, we can uh, clearly see the banding of the DNA polymer on the, that was just deposited on the surface. But since. I'm going to move to the next one since you couldn't see much. Um, so from the first slide, if you remember, I, um, I mentioned that there's many techniques. And there's, um, you know, depending on the time you have, and it, it, it can take more or less time to get quantitative results if you, for example, do four curves. So this is what I want to um, really focus on is the fact that you can go really fast and still get quantitative results. You can do a, a regular one hertz scan and you get a nice image like the one, the first one on the left there on the top. You can go faster, two hertz. 
uh, in this image uh, on the bottom on the left, we're going 10 hertz, and it's still, you can see still the same contrast. And you can even see um, what I mentioned before is you can see some, um, some crystal light. So you're still, be, even though you're going really fast, you're seeing the, the contrast in modulus, but you're also seeing the small features of the sample. And when you start going really fast, 26 hertz and 78 hertz, you start seeing kind of the um, cantilever uh, cannot deal with, um, with going so fast. But you're still keeping the contrast. It's only in the last image when I show you that it starts falling apart and we're not um, tracking anymore. So this technique is really a technique which, um, which allows you to get quantitative results fast. So one important, this is one of the, I, I feel like one of the most important slides is that um, this is a technique which is tapping mode. So we're not pushing into the surface very much. So your sample must be clean. On the top, you have a clean sample. It's, uh, again, the silicon titanium sample. On the bottom, you have a dirty sample. So even though you get topography in both cases, once you come and, and try to do uh, you know, modulus, um, you, you, need, you need to have a clean sample. If not, what you're measuring is basically the tin film of dirt you have on your sample. So there are some, uh, some tricks in terms of getting your sample clean and being um, setting your your tunes exactly to what they should be, but besides that, it's almost as easy as tapping mode imaging. Um, so on that, it's a small summary of what I showed you, and um, yeah, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to try to answer them. Great, let's thank Marta. So in theory, you should be able to resolve quite a bit. It's, it, this, all these calculations are done based on frequency shifts. Um, so in theory, it, you should be able to resolve a lot. Now in practice, um, I, I'm just going to say what I was doing is yeah, looking for, uh, like, let's say, half, uh, half a gigapascal in terms of polymers. That's easy to see. Um, um, another example, we're, we're looking at, I guess, to better answer your question, if you're, in the, if you're looking at two samples that are close together in the same family, like in the same range, you probably have much more, um, much more luck than going from uh, you know, looking at uh, half a gigapascal and 100 gigapascal. Although you will, you will see contrast, <coughs> getting the right modulus will be difficult because you have to think the modulus is always a calculated value and it has to do with models. So it's hard to model a tip contact that is very different depending on the sample. Yes. Um, <clears throat> have you looked at samples that have similar Young's modulus where one is elastic and one is viscoelastic, like for example, octane branch polyethylene that would have say a 16 or 18 megapascal modulus and polyglutadiene, similar molecular weight that has an 18 megapascal modulus, but it's tan delta is on the order of 0.6, as opposed to the polyethylene tan delta is on the order of barely 0.1. The question is about elastic versus viscoelastic materials with similar moduli. Um, so we did a little bit of that, but we haven't tried enough to, to actually go ahead and, and um, one example is some rubbers. Mm -hmm. we, we, can, we can see differences where and we don't see it maybe in the frequency image, but we see it in the dissipation image. So this is, I guess, addressing a question. But uh, you, we have to do a bit more to be comfortable with the, actually the calculation that has to be done in order to get the modulus. So that takes more time. <laughs> Does the blue drop all give you anything? I'm not talking about in water, I'm just talking about in air. Does it buy you anything as far as A or FM versus just mechanically driving those two frequencies? Um, uh, sorry, the question 
is about whether photothermal excitation is better than mechanical excitation in air for this specific application? So I want to say yes, unless you're using, um, we have um, high frequency cantilever holders, which are um, piezo stacks that are um, damped. So you, you get better results than with a regular piezo. Now, between piezo and blue drive, what blue drive gives you, even if it's in air, is um, you, it's very stable and very reproducible. So what's important in AMFM measurements is that you start with a frequency, you, you do your tune and you start at a certain frequency and then you image your sample. And what you use to do the calculations is actually the shift in frequency. So if you're able to really precisely say what was your initial frequency and then see how it changed during the measurement, then your modulus value that you calculate will be more precise or more exact. So um, yes, I think that using blue drive, you, you get um, a, a more precise reading from the beginning. So you, you might get a, a more exact number for your modulus. But in terms of having um, relative modular values, I think it should be the same.